pollution that you just see there and you say, that's gross, right? Um, and yet, how do you tie those things together? Which is one reason that we don't talk about climate change nearly as on our videos. You see very little reference to it. There's a couple things about carbon footprint. In general, it's about environmental stewardship. Because we want students to start up this, I think of it as a staircase, it's recycling the first step. And then, you know, to start to learn about these things so they become part of their lives because, and so that they become the social norm. You're not doing this because you think, I'm saving the planet. It's because it's what's normal. It's what everyone else is doing. I think you hit it right there. When you move from a, uh, I have to go fix the globe to a, a stewardship, all of a sudden you're in a very immediate, very intimate, personal level, which is actually the only place you can move. So if I can give you an update of the work I can continue sure. to do, yeah. like just yesterday, I, you know, I go in and I do these big crazy lectures about how it's all connected, and here's Maslow's you know, hierarchy of needs, and here's what you need, your air, water, your food, all of the other stuff, this stuff actually feeds into that, and look at it, it's all connected to these parts of the planet, and all of a sudden, the difference between them and the planet, there is no difference. And so I start to tell them, like, you know, like, why you should love soil, why you should love this, why you should love that. And it's funny, yesterday morning, they came in, and they were, I was pretty tired, had to be there at 8 a.m., oh my god. And these guys come in, in their little stripes, and they're still buzzing and everything, and they're like, oh yeah, what are we going to do? What are we going to talk about today? Who, oh, who, who are you? Oh, at, at um, Elmwood, uh, Elmwood Jail. So I'm, te I'm still teaching yeah. up at San Quentin and also here. For those who don't know, Lisa works with inmates. Was the same point for a master's thesis and now working kind of deal. I'm still above. But anyway, but what's fun is the Elmwood thing is I have a lot more time and a lot more leeway with what I do with my time. And what was cool was they said, yeah, you know, we go back and we're like talking about this stuff all day. And people are coming up and going, what are you guys talking about? And it's great, but I mean, we're totally weirdos there because nobody's talking about this stuff, but we're all talking about this stuff. And it's like, it doesn't get better than that, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's, it doesn't. It's not about the planet, it's about every moment I have a new decision to do something that's either cool or less cool. And, and I know that doing the cool thing feels better. And, and, and so that brings in kind of the mindfulness. And, that, and that's it, that's the, that it feels better. Right. It's better for me. And that's what I was hearing, in the stewardship and the yeah. because it's normal, right? What's cool about that was like, I don't have to be normal, I just want to do the cool thing. Thing. And, and so it's kind of like taking it off of the global scale and make, bringing it to the mindful moment by moment by moment. I mean, I bring in, you know, uh, Viktor Frankl and the, you're in a, doesn't get much more oppressive and hopeless than a concentration camp, but if you have the choice of splitting your loaf of bread or not doing so, that's, that's empowering, right? You know, bring the empowerment down to the microscopic level in some ways. And that, to me, observing is the only way we, it, it brings it to the human skill that we have uh, available to us. Right? And I'll just share with you something that really strikes me is that sci our scientific community, climate scientists, we thought that when we presented you with you being the, the world, when we presented you with the data, and, and I showed you the trajectory of how temperature is going to change, that we would respond and act. And yet it's much more complicated than that. And now we're starting to work with people like Lisa and people who study humans and think about other things to try to figure out what to do about it. Because just showing graphs and, and charts is not work. It doesn't work. <laughs> you know? it, it worked for uh, ozone depletion, but it was a fairly simple fix to that that didn't put a whole industry out of business. In this, in this case, this is uh, actually shifting a whole planet. We have to change everything. And uh, so it is really fun to work with people in all these different fields, like in the visual arts and then psychology. I think people understand about brains and people who are kind of in tune with how do we get people to really feel like this is something that, that they want to participate in and get involved in. Um, and we don't, definitely don't have the answers. But we're at least asking better questions and to a variety of bigger diversity of people. I think it's interesting you talk about economics as well because I remember back in the 70s, right, Herman Daly said we need to have a non-expanding economic system. We need to have a steady state mm -hmm. economics. And, um, and if you look at, again, other countries, they've relied on a finite resource base much more successfully than we have. We've always, the U.S. has always relied on this expanding resource base. You know, I've got, I want a clean cup, let's all move one space on, right? So 
if we can shift the economic system to a steady state economic system that is more about living within our means, we could easily, without hardly trying, radically reduce our carbon footprint. Um, it was just that even moving to the European mindset would help us an awful lot. That's right. So. There's a magazine some of you might have encountered called Adbusters. It's a, I don't know if anyone's funny. Ever, it's a funny magazine. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty tough. Like, uh, anyhow, they did this um, uh, this look at what the next 50 years potentially could look like, kind of fictionalized. But based, and climate change was the. It's not a necessarily. They're really using art to mock um, our economy and our capitalist ways, like kind of socialist. But climate change is the kind of primary driver of environmental change. So they have this scenario, and you read this long story about how life eventually gets to that point where we decided that, um, that the economy doesn't have to grow all the time. And then, but it was a pretty rough road, and we lost 3 billion people. And um, it wasn't the way that we would like to design things. Because if we lose on the order of a million or more people because of environmental problems, uh, there are going to be wars, there's gonna, you know, it's not going to, and the economy's going to tank, and things are not going to go well. So can we do this in a, can we figure that, what, what you just articulated, can we figure that out in a nice smooth pattern? Or do we have to have the economy completely collapse, and solar panels being the things people are looting all over the place, because that's the only way to get power? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not the kind of, that's not the way we want to get there, to then finally realize, okay, yeah, that we didn't, we were on a good path. Um, so that's our, that's our challenge. And um, I, there's a lot of great people thinking in this space. And the fact that the Europeans, especially like the this Bank of England, says we got to divest from fossil fuels. Awesome. Um, this divestment movement, you know, um, we don't want to divest. They were, the, this article was saying we don't want to divest too quick because we could kill the stock market because it's got a lot of its value in fossil fuel companies. But if some key players are starting to put them into the mind that, you know, we're not going to continue to go this way. There may be some real investment in alternatives. Yeah, if you look at the yeah. political system here, and this is something that we all have control over in the sense that uh, ranging from Ash Kara, the local city council person who is fighting the oil trains that are coming in and out of San Jose, he's a person who you can talk to in his office uh, down the street. And we could be, all of us, engaging at that level, at the local level. He's going to run for assembly, support him, oh, yeah, um, support him as he moves up. Next thing you know, he could be president. We honestly don't know what the possibilities are unless we all really do engage at the grassroots level. And that's combating the oil money that is currently supporting everyone at the top in this country. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> well, so the way I, was de I describe when I talk about the whole the oil in the ground thingy and how so much economic assumption is absolutely resting on that. And I describe it as a, a noose, right? As we pull it out of the ground, it's basically a noose that we're that we're building for ourselves. Yeah. So do you? I mean, what's that worth to you? Really, really? Because that's what you get when you're done, you know. And so I think the slowly weaning us off of that assumption that this is it awesome gold that bars that we all want yeah. and need, you know, it's 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 a shift of the only reason it's worth something is because we think it's worth something. So yeah, go out there and do some great things, yes. you guys. Thank and, you very uh, much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.